Welcome back to the channel. The media has been getting a number of the health and science news stories around the Trump administration all wrong. And of course, it's natural that they would do that. They rely on experts who didn't vote for Trump, don't like Trump, and will do anything for Trump to fail. They want Trump to fail. And so they're asking these experts what they think about what Trump's doing, and they're giving a skewed perspective. Now, the media could ask experts who support some of the policies or ask for a more thoughtful and nuanced view of the issue, but they choose not to do that. So I just want to give you a couple examples of where that's happening. Number one, layoffs. Now, first of all, my heart goes out to anyone who lost their job. We all know that's a situation nobody wants to be in. We don't like it when it happens in our family. We don't like it to happen to a friend of ours. But the reality is in America, people get laid off from time to time. If you work at Google or Facebook or any of these big companies, there are often five or 10% cuts in staffing. Now, are all the people laid off bad people? No, naturally some of those people are good people too, but it's done so that the organization can be leaner, so it can function better. And nobody calls that a bloodbath. Nobody says a generation of Facebook is over. They often look back on it and say that was a smart structural move to improve the margins of the company. But when it comes to government, that's not the rhetoric people use. Every sort of layoff is a bloodbath. A generation of scientists are lost. This is empty rhetoric. It's no such thing. On the screen, I'm going to show you a figure that I had to ask around to get. This is what no media story has in it. This is from a Cato Institute publication, and this is the number of people who work at HHS over time. And what you can see is it went up from, in 1996, 55,000 to over 80,000 in Biden. Now, what does this mean? It means that all of the articles talking about a 10% cut to HHS should acknowledge the fact that we're really returning to Obama-level staffing. We're not even going back to Bush. So is it really so catastrophic? I find it hard to believe. And everyone who's ever worked in government or interacted with government knows it is full of bureaucratic processes that don't make any sense. And it very likely can undergo a haircut and still function, perhaps even function better, because some people are making work for other people to do to justify their own existence. The next topic. The next thing I think we have complete and total dishonesty about from the media is the NIH grant cuts. I see there are even profiles of individuals who say, my grant was cut. I actually, side note, I saw somebody who lost a grant for um, uh, a book that they were writing through the National Endowments for Humanities or something. I looked up the title of the book. The title of the book is The Racialization of Print. Um, of course, that's going to get cut. I don't understand how government can fund it in the first place. You're telling me we're going to tax plumbers and bus drivers and, and lunch ladies in school so that someone else can write an extremely left-wing book about the racialization of print. And not only is it a left-wing book, obviously from the title and the content, but it's a book that no one's going to even want to read. I mean, if you wouldn't even be able to sell such a book because nobody wants to read that book. Listen, I'm the author of two academic books. I know how hard it is to get someone to read a book. If I wrote a book called The Racialization of Print, it would, be, it would fare even worse than Ending Medical Reversal, which wasn't exactly a bestseller. You, you have to have some sense. The government shouldn't subsidize, subsidize these ridiculous, ridiculous pieces of writing and taxing regular people to pay for it makes no sense at all. And it certainly doesn't make sense when more Americans overwhelmingly don't like these kinds of DEI concepts. They don't like it. That's why they voted for Trump, because they're sick of this. So I actually have a copy from Appendix 3, language provided to NIH by HHS for what to cut funding on. I'm going to read you some of the language, and you decide for yourself if this is good cuts or bad cuts. Topic 1, China. It says, quote, bolstering Chinese universities does not enhance the American people's quality of life or improve Americans' position in the world. On the contrary, funding research in China contravenes national security interests and hinders foreign policy objectives. Of course that's true. What, are we supposed to subsidize China too? Aren't they the rival? Aren't they our, our potential rival on the global stage? So, and had we not funded China research in the first place, we might not have had the pandemic because we're funding those ridiculous outsource uh, experiments on coronavirus. Number two, DEI. Quote, research programs based primarily on artificial and non-scientific categories, including amorphous equity objectives, are antithetical to scientific inquiry, do nothing to expand our knowledge of living systems, provide low return on investment, and do not enhance health, lengthen life, or reduce illness, or so-called DEI. Studies are often used to support unlawful discrimination since race and other protected characteristics, uh, since race is an, one of the protected characteristics, which harms the health of Americans. Therefore, it is the policy of NIH to not prioritize such research programs. That seems reasonable to me, too. 
We had a study a few years ago about how if a black doctor takes care of a black neonate, the death rate is half that a white doctor taking care of a black neonate. When I read that study, I found it preposterous. There's nothing in medicine that has an effect on size of 50%. So there's some coding error. When I looked at it more, I saw that attribution between baby and doctor was really crappy. When it was reanalyzed, they found that the effect vanished when you adjusted for birth weight, but it probably has still even other errors in it. Meanwhile, Ketanji Brown Jackson has included it as a reference in a Supreme Court case. What's my point? Low credibility DEI research is harmful to the American narrative of who we are. It's harmful to the truth. It makes people think that if they have a white doctor, the baby is twice as likely to die. That's just not true. And it's a harmful and I would say bigoted view to offer that based on low credibility science. And of course it should be defunded transgendered issues. Research programs based on gender identity, often unscientific, have little identifiable return on investment, do nothing to enhance the health of many Americans. Many studies ignore rather than seriously examine biologic realities. We found out in the New York Times just a few months ago that there's a researcher who conducted a transgendered study that didn't give her the answer she wanted about, I think, regret, and she has chosen to suppress those findings and not publish it. This was asked to Jay Bhattacharya at the NIH uh, Senate confirmation. The public paid for that research, it should be funded. Transgender research can be done, I think, in a thoughtful way, but it has to be done by people who are scientists and not activists. And frankly, I don't see a lot of them in that space. If you have a researcher who won't publish findings that disagree with her conclusion, that's not a researcher who should ever receive federal funding, full stop. And I do think it would be reasonable to not fund this research until people figure out how to do it right or not do it at all. And we actually have a sort of a meta research paper in this space that's percolating, maybe eventually published. But it also points out that the quality of the evidence in the space is very poor, which is actually the conclusion of the, uh, of the UK CAS report, which is something that people don't want to accept. But of course, the quality of the evidence is extremely poor. And transgendered issues, research programs, simply try to cater to a narrative rather than answer fundamental questions. Vaccine hesitancy, quote, it is the policy of the NIH not to prioritize research activities that focus on gaining knowledge as to why individuals are hesitant to be vaccinated and explore ways to improve vaccine interest and commitment. Now, here's a tricky one. I think it is important to understand why people don't want to be vaccinated, but I do agree that it should be defunded for now, and here's why. Because I'm not convinced that anyone working in this space is doing it honestly. Everyone wants to say, oh, the reason people are hesitant to be vaccinated is RFK Jr. and Joe Rogan and all those folks on the right. What about the fact that Peter Marks approved a booster for a six-month-old baby year after year after year without any randomized data? Wait a second. The CDC said if your baby just had COVID, your eight-year-old had COVID, they still need a COVID shot? Really? Really? The, and they mandated it for me at work, but I got COVID at work because I'm working in the healthcare and I didn't want to get the shot. Now they fired me. Those are anti-vaccine actions. Those poisonous, debilitating actions are anti-vaccine actions. These researchers are not including them in the panoply of things that may be causing hesitancy. So as such, if you're not willing to have an open mind about what might be the root of hesitancy, and also to acknowledge that sometimes hesitancy is a good thing because I'm not getting any more boosters for COVID ever. And that's a good hesitancy. It's protecting me from the stupidity of public health experts um, <laughs> who are, and, and regulators. Sometimes hesitancy would be good. So all these things have to be factored into a proper research program. And until they do so, they have no ability to do so right now. Defunded. Perfect. COVID. The end of the pandemic caused us to terminate COVID-related grants. Yeah, it should be terminated. I saw somebody saying that I'm working on a new antiviral for COVID and my grant was terminated. And they were like, oh, that's so boo-hoo-hoo, you know, my grant. What about the next plague? Well, if you want to study antivirals for a future plague, let's do that. But you're not, that's not your grant, buddy. Your grant's not to study a pan-coronavirus antiviral. It's not to study an antiviral for influenza. It's to develop an antiviral for this COVID-19, which is now a common cold respiratory virus that will forever circulate. So I think this should be defunded. And I think it should send a message. We overfunded COVID-19 science. A lot of it came way too late. And now we're defunding it. So again, the media narrative, most of these NIH grants need to be cut. Anytime you quote anyone who says, my grant is cut, what about my career? Pull the grant, read the grant. Every time I'm reading it, I'm like, this is a bad grant. Should never have been funded in the first place. And what am I to think when, when you get a Democrat in office and they fund anything with a diversity and an equity in it, 
and then you get a Republican in office and they cut the funding, why is the Republican the bad guy? The Democrat was just funding the, the, the sort of the stuff that, they, that supports their base. And now the Republican is just unfunny. It's the nature of politics. If we're going to have science be funded by political fad cycles, which I disagree with, I think it should be neutral, which means you would never have funded the diversity work in the first place and you would never need to cancel it in the second place. Science should be funded based on, this is another key point. I saw someone say that we're defunding some projects in pancreas cancer, but pancreas cancer kills a lot of people, so we should fund it. This is a common fallacy. Funding should not be proportionate to how common something is or how bad it is. Those things are, are important factors, but there's one thing that is the final most important factor, which is the pro each dollar you spend should have the greatest return in life years possible. Now, it's plausible the things that are more dire and that are uh, very common, if you can cure them, you're going to save more lives. But the other thing that's included in science funding is promise. If what you're funding is incredibly low promise, then it doesn't matter how common or how dire it is because there's low promise. Meanwhile, if something is rare and maybe medium lethality, but the promise for cure is so, so high, that's the priority. We should fund based on expected life years gained, not the disability life years lost from a disease. It's just a classic fallacy. And if you think about it more, it is treating to the absolute risk reduction. My medicine colleagues will understand what I mean. It's treating to the absolute risk reduction, not the baseline risk, okay? It's a classic logical principle. You treat to the expected gain. And so, you know, I think a lot of the research is unpromising, okay? So what do you want? They can't keep funding you to throw money in the toilet. So those are my thoughts. The media is not doing a good job of covering this. Even Peter Mark's departure from the FDA, the media has done a very poor job. They portray Marx as if he's some saint who's been pushed out by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. He is no such thing. He came to FDA at the age of 49. I think he's leaving now at 61. When he came to the FDA, he had 29 publications. He was a hematologist at Yale. He had trained at Harvard and Columbia. I just want to put a little bit in perspective. I'm 42. I'm seven years younger than when he joined FDA. I have 500 plus publications. I have two books peer reviewed by Johns Hopkins Press. Peter Marx had no books. Peter Marx, to have 29 publications at nearly the age of 50 in academics, that's a very weak portfolio. That's a mediocre academic portfolio. I think many of us who are professors would view that as sort of a clinical professor kind of role. He doesn't seem to me like a research professor. So don't pretend that he was the best person who got the job. He just got the job because back in those years, it was very hard to recruit for FDA because they pay so low, you know, and they have all these prohibitions on what they can do while working at FDA. So, I mean, I think they should pay higher. But then while at FDA, he made a number of mistakes. The Duchenne's muscular dystrophy gene therapy, on two occasions, you had primary study reviewers say this product should not come to the market. This is Sarepta's gene therapy for Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, making a truncated dystrophin protein. Two occasions, on the accelerated approval occasion, Peter Marks overrode the primary study reviewers. He thought it was reasonably likely to have clinical benefit, the surrogate endpoint. Then there's a confirmatory study which is negative. Negative confirmatory study, the reviewers again voted against, re reviewed against granting regular approval conversion. He overrode them again and put it on the market and made sure it had a regular approval so it can't be rescinded for efficacy claims in the future. He overrode the investigators, the, the reviewers, again. And what happened? Number of positive randomized controlled trials of the gene therapy, zero. Number of boys dead of hepatic toxicity, one. Peter Marks has an extremely bad batting average. He's bending over backwards to cater to pharma, but it's not clear he's making American people better. The media, when they interview him, they don't cover this at all. They talk about how he's done such a great job with vaccines. Has he? Denmark doesn't give a six-month-old baby a COVID-19 vaccine every single year. You, if you're an eight-month-old baby, you don't get a vaccine for COVID, and then when you're then at 20 months, you get another vaccine for COVID, and another year later, you get another vaccine for COVID. You don't get that at Denmark. Why do we have it in this country? Does Peter Marks have a randomized control trial that supports giving a baby booster after booster year after year? No. Do the American people trust Peter Marks? No. No one's boosting their kids like this. Peter Marks is a reckless, reckless vaccine promoter. He is not a scientific vaccine promoter. That's a misnomer. He is a pro-pharmaceutical company, low regulatory barrier, excessive promoter. What did he do around KP1, variant target selection? The media, so stupid, they don't even know. KP1, who chose the target in the annual COVID-19 booster shot last year? Who pushed back on Verbach and said, quote, when I go to the milk case, I buy the most recent milk. This is the level of evidence Peter Marx is operating with. Colloquialisms, it's a low level of evidence. So when he goes on, 
on TV and he tries to portray himself as some great advocate for science, we can rest assured that that is very unlikely to be true. The media, they're not capable of doing an honest appraisal of these scientific facts. They just don't have it in them. They don't have it in them to say he's a mediocre guy who made a number of mistakes. They just don't have it in them. And I think it's really bad. It's really bad. It's just going to make society more and more fragmented if they just cannot be honest once and just say what somebody's strengths and weaknesses are honestly. I think it's, we're really reaching a bad state that I, a professor and hematologist oncologist, have to spend my time making YouTube videos to try to just set the record straight. And many people say that I have a bias. I do not. I am a neutral observer here, and I'm trying to shoot down the center. The problem is the media is so deranged, it may look like I'm going in the other direction, but I'm just trying to clarify things. You notice I'm also not saying he was, they were wrong to... This is a way in which I'm quite balanced. I believe that the first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine for an older non-immune person, first quarter 2021, was a life-saving advance. You know, I've written a nice little paper on that, I think, in Monash Bioethics. Uh, that's something that I think other people get wrong, too. But that doesn't mean that booster after booster after booster was necessary. That doesn't mean the first dose is super valid. If you're somehow in 2025, you never had a dose. I would never get one if you've made it this far without having a dose, you know. And it certainly doesn't mean we should have been doing it for 20-year-olds. It certainly doesn't mean we should have um, pushed out Gruber Krauss. That's another thing. Peter Marks is instrumental in the ouster of Marion Gruber and Phil Krauss, the director and deputy director at FDA Products. Peter Marks pressured them to give a booster for all policy in the fall of 2021. Paul Offit himself. A vaccine developer said he disagreed with that policy in the Washington Post, and he himself at 72 did not get one, he told his son not to get one. But Peter Marks took it down to kids to get the booster. That is a ridiculous policy. Ridiculous policy. Peter Marks also pressured, this is uh, Phil Krause's testimony to Congress, Peter Marks wanted to quickly convert Pfizer's emergency use authorization to biological licensing agreement so that Biden could mandate those shots. You want to talk about anti-vaxxers? The biggest anti-vaxxers on the planet were the people who mandated that COVID-19 shot in the fall of 2021 without exemptions for prior immunity and targeting young people who are not at high risk of bad outcomes. They're the biggest anti-vaxxers who've lived in this quarter century because they have done more to sow distrust in the public consciousness than anything any podcaster ever said. They have done so much damage. All you needed to do was make the vaccine available, let older unimmune people get it, encourage it in those populations, leave young people alone. And that ironically was the premise of the Great Barrington Declaration, focus on the elderly, which is something that the Biden administration could never understand. And that is the failure of the media. And you had a bunch of rich, uh, left-leaning coastal elites sitting at home in their apartments ordering Uber Eats and telling us why we should all stay in our houses. And they have failed and betrayed society so profoundly. Those are my thoughts. If you like this video, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below. I'll be back with more videos. And um, that's all I got. Follow me on Instagram. Follow me on drvanayprasad.com, my sub stack. And uh, until next time.